Hello, welcome to CAT 109, CAT 109, the politics, history, and ethics of the cannabis industry. Today we are starting the class, the first class, and we're going to talk about the ABCs of THC and CBD. I had to go there. So before we, you know, get into the medical aspect, I just want to define some of the elements and the words that we're going to be using. So cannabis is a group of flowering plants that has long been used for industrial, recreational, and medical purposes. In this class we will use the term medical cannabis when we reference it. Cannabis is a genus of flowering plants in the cannabis family which consists of three primary spe species. Cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and cannabis ruderalis. Marijuana is a term used to classify varieties of cannabis that contain more than 0.3% THC. So when we look at these three different concepts, we're also realizing that there's other issues, especially with the THC and CBD, which we will be discussing in great detail. So the term medical cannabis is used to describe cannabis plants and plant material such as flower buds or full plant extracts. The term for registered medical cannabis extracts that have defined THC and THC CBD content is cannabis derived or cannabis based medicines. And again, you know, this is a very specific perspective because as you read research studies, you're going to have to know the terminology so that you understand the difference between, um, you know, medical cannabis and cannabis derived. So, little fun fact here, cannabis can be a male or a female, a boy or a girl. Um, you'll see pictures um, on the slide here. On the left hand side we have our boy symbol, fairly representational. Um, and you'll see that the plant tends to be taller and the leaves more sparse. On the right is the female plant and the female plant has um, a much more tightly budded um, flowered tops. So cannabis, it's technically called diocetious, which means that there are sexually distinct male and female plants. While both genders of cannabis generate the resin, which is the part that makes you feel high, um, female plants tend to produce more resin and flower later in the growth cycle which makes the female plants more appealing to consumers. Some cannabis growers recommend destroying male plants to allow room for more female plants. Um, and of course, you know, we respect our male plants, so, you know, your mileage may vary. The resin is excreted by glandular hairs located around the flowers and the lower portion of the plant. To properly cultivate a marijuana or cannabis plant, a grower must pay close attention to the plant at each stage of its life cycle and maintain exact conditions in its environment, such as proper temperature, lighting, and humidity. In contrast, hemp is grown to maximize its size and yield. To achieve this, hemp is typically grown outdoors and does not require the level of control and attention that is necessary to grow marijuana. So hemp is more of a crop that you just leave it alone, it grows, and then you, you know, harvest, and you will have yourself a fairly hardy plant that you will grow back year after year with proper soil management, of course. A moment. THC directly binds to the CB1 and CB2 receptors in the endocannabinoid system and this induces that mild mind-altering euphoric effect referred to as being high. 
uh, the CBD does not bind directly to the CB1 and CB2 receptors, but instead impacts them indirectly. These indirect actions include activating TRPV1 receptors that work to control important functions like pain perception, body temperature, and inflammation. CBD can also increase the amount of anandamide in the body, known as the bliss molecule anandamide, plays a role in the neural generation of pleasure and motiva motivation. So, you know, you're going to have people who rely exclusively on CBD um, oils or additives, and then you're going to have other people who, because of pain or pressure or anxiety, really do need that THC. So, you know, it's, it's about levels of pain, and it's about understanding one's own pain. So, we have heard a lot about hemp, and some of us know a lot about hemp, and others not so much, so we're going to give you a little lesson on hemp. And in the cannabis world, especially if you're a cannabis business major, there is such an opportunity to go into hemp manufacturing, hemp cultivation, hemp harvesting. Hemp is a massive tool that was used when the United States was just an infant to build the economy, to build the infrastructure. And yet, for many, many, many years now, it has been um, really the red-headed stepchild, with apologies to red-headed stepchilds everywhere, um, of, of the um, world of farming. So, hemp comes from the stem of the cannabis plant. Hemp is a term used to classify varieties of cannabis that contain 0.3% or less of THC content. Hemp is a strain of the cannabis sativa plant species that is grown specifically for industrial use. Male plants are generally best for use as hemp. And remember, when we went back a couple slides, we talked about how the female plants are the ones that are going to get you quote unquote high, whereas the male plants have very low levels of THC in them, so not as helpful. So we don't want to kill them. We're, we're not getting rid of our male plants. We're going to use them to grow industrial hemp. The stem is covered in strong fibers, and to remove the fibers, the stem is soaked in water, which will detach from the non-fibrous tissue. The stem is then bent so that the fibers separate. Once they have been separate, these fibers can be stripped away and turned into thread or twisted into rope. Hemp is best grown in mild, humid climates, which helps produce stronger, more durable fibers. So over here on the right, you'll see a hemp farm in Illinois. Illinois is very humid. It is incredibly humid, um, but it doesn't get super hot. So it's a great place to grow that. Now, cannabis is best raised in hot, dry climates, which helps produce the resin or the THC, but the fiber is of poor quality. So over here on the left, you'll see a cannabis farm in Colorado. A couple things you should notice is that while hemp grows very tall, the cannabis plants tend to be stunted. And again, that is part of the cultivation technique. CBD can be derived from either hemp or marijuana. So whichever direction you decide to go in, business majors, you have a lot of options if you learn about horticulture, about growing, and knowing what products can be used from the plant itself. So, hemp is harvested to produce a wide variety of products, including, but not limited to. So, in ancient China, soldiers discovered that using hemp as their bowstring to shoot their arrows made them fly further and harder, meaning you killed your enemy. So. You know, there's a reason that the Chinese army was so feared 
and impressive in the ancient era. Industrial products such as paper, clothing, building materials, and plastic. So if you look over here on the right, there's a pair of pants. They're hemp pants. And you'll see that they have a nice little uh, marijuana leaf with it saying Himalayan 100% hemp THC free, meaning you can't smoke your shorts and get high, but you can feel good about wearing organic clothing um, that is usually harvested in a less uh, brutal way than other um, fabrics can be often harvested. So, um, food products such as cooking oil, hemp flour, and hemp seed based products, and medicinal products such as CBD oil tinctures and CBD infused topical creams. So you will we'll go into a, you know, kind of a nice part of the city where you live and if cannabis um, is something that's available in your country, you'll often see CBD products. They are legal most. So we'll be going to talk about that for the, in a few minutes. So let's talk about the differences between hemp and cannabis. Hemp can grow as high as 20 feet, which leaves bunched near the top of the stem. Contains 0.3% or less of THC, tetrahydrocannabinoid. There's no psychoactive properties. It doesn't make you feel high, in other words, and can grow in most climates bunched together with other plants and requires little care. On the other hand, marijuana, shorter, resembles a bush with more leaves and buds surrounding the body's plant. The plant's body, you know what I mean. Contains usually between 5 to 35 percent of THC. The psychoactive side effects are significant and anyone who has ever um, taken cannabis for medical or recreational purposes knows that there is a certain feeling of uh, euphoria or your body relaxes and you feel just less tense. Growth is carefully monitored, controlled in an isolated, warm, humid area to maximize psychoactive uses. Cross-pollination can ruin the THC content. So the horticulture aspect is such a significant part of learning about cannabis and medical cannabis because it really takes a delicate hand when growing to grow the best quality. So we also have the CBD which under the agricultural bill of 2018 commonly known as the 2018 farm bill so last year um, it, it being 2019 now, hemp and hemp derived products including hemp derived CBD were legalized. A common misconception about the 2018 Farm Bill is that it legalized CBD regardless of if it was derived from hemp or marijuana. It's not true. So based on the guidance of the, C of the DEA, and we'll talk about them in a minute, CBD, when it is derived from marijuana, is still considered a Scheduled I controlled substance. However, if the CBD is derived from hemp, which contains no more than 0.3% THC, it would be regulated as a controlled substance and is federally legal, meaning you can make money, put it in the bank, and not worry about the government trying to seize it. So, and for those of you who really enjoy chemistry, you'll see over there on the right hand side um, the chemical uh, of each. So, what exactly is the difference between THC and CBD? They're both cannabinoids derived from the cannabis plant, but they're different in very many ways. So, THC is what gives us that feeling of being high. The effects include euphoria and altered sense, you know, you kind of, things taste better or colors seem to pop more. Altered understanding of time, time goes by so quickly or it seems to drag. 
um, especially if you're watching a really bad movie. Impaired response time, and again, that's why driving while using a THC product is absolutely um, not recommended. And of course, memory impairment. This helps significantly, though, with so, relieving while hemp was previously regulated as loss an illegal and substance insomnia. under the Controlled so, Substance Act you know, of 19. Initially, it was removed as an illegal substance um, under the Agricultural at the Improvement Act of, of Medical Cannabis or the Farm Bill, seeking it which federally legalized hemp and hemp derived products that with contain no more than 0.3% THC. Or marijuana, AIDS on the other hand, is still that treated as a control substance. So a lot and of these things, federally, you know, it was illegal a very under the Controlled Substances Act in many now, ways. Now, what's that um, situation? Really uh, is I remember 30 years about ago is that a friend of mine the president with multiple or the attorney general decided his mom used to, to go buy after him, the medical um, cannabis cannabis um, and recreational cannabis that's to help him with his muscle spasms. The state so would then get into you know, that times have changed states and it's rights much better versus system now. federal government rights. But people which, have known about if you this remember, for a long time. Your Intro CBD to American on the history other hand, class in ninth grade. You don't get that euphoria. You didn't understand you what the big fuss was about. Wow, I but feel here it so is. light. The federal government on the other says hand, you that do get a medical cannabis functional effect, or it's excellent uh, recreational for cannabis is daytime illegal. pain and anxiety. And all and federal it helps regulate the response to THC with so anything if a person related gets too high. To they can take um, straight CBD oil. That to could regulate the effect. So if you drop under the tongue, actions that the government straight does out and they such as overwhelmed allowing by cannabis you know, being uh, high. And again, people to sometimes in the beginning money they can that they've have earned very scary experiences problematic, they're which not is why you use a cash to that business. feeling. Because if you just put in the cash and say it was for services rendered, that's a much different situation than saying you are selling legal cannabis and it is ridiculous and it's insane and you know uh, legislation is working its way through congress but things don't go quickly as we know but that's the biggest problem with it being federally illegal is the banks and at some point you might get an attorney general who decides that he's going to come after cannabis and he will put the DEA on that or the ATF and it just it, it gets really ugly and we briefly had that under Trump um, when his one attorney general decided to go after the cannabis and then as soon as he resigned we got back to uh, focusing on bigger issues so as of May 2019 a total of 34 states District of Columbia Guam, Puerto Rico, and U.S. Virgin Islands have approved a comprehensive publicly available medical marijuana or cannabis program, keeping in mind that the District of Columbia, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands are all territories that the U.S. manages that potentially could become states one day. So in addition to adding some stars to our flag, um, these four other areas which literally are almost like junior level states have all used this medical cannabis program what's left there's literally 16 states that haven't you know accepted it and they're mostly in the south in pennsylvania governor wolf signed legislation in 2016 legalizing medical cannabis and pa officially launched its medical cannabis program in january 2018 so we're only a year and a half into it. However, in the first year, 80,000 Pennsylvania residents registered to participate in the medical cannabis program. So as you can see, there's a massive demand. It's very hard to get 80,000 people to go anywhere or do anything, much less you know, sign up to participate in something um, which a lot of people are still culturally feeling that it might be inappropriate but anyone who is in desperate pain understands the willingness to um, essentially try anything so you'll see here the six um, dispensary 
regions in Pennsylvania. We're in region one, the southeast, where Philly is and Chester. So the little purple one on the bottom right. Here we go looking at the states. Um, so you will see that most of the states have some. Um, you're going to see, actually, I'm sorry, it wasn't the southern states, it's the Midwest, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Idaho, um, not very enthused about having a medical marijuana program. On the other hand, what you see is that there are a lot of states that are not only having this comprehensive medical marijuana program, but there's also a recreational. Um, this is June 2019, actually July 2019, and the last week of June, Illinois passed their recreational marijuana law. So as you can see, it's a growing area, and as it continues to grow, um, more and more of these states will go to dark green um, military green, so to speak, like California and Colorado. So why is the federal government so convinced that cannabis is the devil's lettuce? Good question. In September 2018, the Drug Enforcement Agency reclassified the CBD derived products. Remember, they have to be from hemp, not from the marijuana, from Schedule 1 to Schedule 5 of the Controlled Substances Act. All cannabis products that contain THC are considered Schedule 1 substances, the highest level of control. These are the biggies, and we're going to look at them in a moment. The Controlled Substances Act is the statute that established the federal U.S. drug policy under which manufacture, importation, possession, use, and distribution of certain substances is regulated, and there is President Nixon, right over there on the right-hand side, um, before he had to resign in disgrace for criminal acts, uh, signing the law. It was passed by the U.S. Congress as part of the Comprehensive Drug Abuse Prevention and Control Act of 1970. So, 50 years later, we're still literally dealing with this very archaic law. So who's in charge of it? Well, the legislation created five schedules or classifications with varying qualifications for a substance to be included in each. Two federal agencies, the Drug Enforcement Administration and the Food and Drug Administration, determine which substances are added or removed from the various schedules. Although Congress can pass statutes declaring certain substances, a Schedule 1 drug, and they did this with the date rape drug GHB in 2000 when they reclassified it. So, you know, sometimes when there is such a significant political push, you do see statutes and legislation being passed to recategorize. Keep this in mind because this is why it's so important to vote and why it's so important to participate in the political system of your country especially if you're in the US. So how does something end up on the controlled substance schedule? A major determining factor for identifying which schedule a substance belongs to is its potential for abuse. In other words, how likely are you going to be addicted to this, abusing it? And for those of you who may not be clued in to the terminology, when we talk about substance abuse. We call it, and this is the medical term, substance use disorder. And the key determining factor for substance use disorder is how it impacts your life. So for, you know, the millions of people out there who may indulge in the week on the weekend recreationally, but go to work Monday through Friday or Tuesday through Saturday, you know, they are not dealing with an abuse situation. It's not impacting their day-to-day -day life or their relationships. So, second, is this drug used as a current medical treatment in the US? There's a five-part test for currently accepted medical use. Number one, 
The drug chemistry must be known and reproducible. There must be adequate safety studies. There must be adequate and well-controlled studies proving efficacy, meaning it works. The drug must be accepted by qualified experts and the scientific evidence must be widely available. Safety and potential for addiction. Is the drug safe? How long? How likely will this drug cause addiction and what kinds of addiction? So here's some examples that I, I just want you to look at the absurdity in, in many of these. So schedule one, high potential for abuse, currently no accepted medical use federally, keep in mind federally, cannabis, heroin, LSD, ecstasy, and peyote. So yes, we know that heroin is very bad. We get that. We see the pictures. But, and here's a very interesting thing now, when you look at cannabis, there are thousands of studies that have been done in the last 20 years that actually demonstrate a clear correlation between use and pain relief. With LSD, and this is where it's getting even more interesting, they're finding that micro doses of LSD can help individuals with long-term depression. So LSD, they're trying to also get that put into a situation. Now, the difference between cannabis and LSD is cannabis grows, LSD is made in a lab. So it can be f literally taken and made into a pharmacology uh, product. Schedule two, high potential for abuse and dependence accepted medical application. So we have things like Vicodin, cocaine, methamphetamine, Oxycontin, fentanyl, Adderall, and Dexedrine. So let's just take a moment and look at the fact that cannabis is considered more dangerous than meth. We could do a faces of cannabis and a faces of meth and let me tell you Snoop Dogg still looks better than anybody else in the world after 30 years. Schedule 3. Medium potential for abuse, moderate potential for dependence, accepted medical applications. Tylenol with codeine, ketamine, and anabolic steroids. So, um, and again, ketamine is also being used now um, for patients with long-term serious depression. So that's a pretty interesting concept here. You know, that was a horse tranquilizer that people used and still use probably in clubs. Uh, we called it Special K in the olden days. Um, and then, of course, Tylenol with codeine. If you go up to Canada, you'll find it legally sold over the counter. So there you go. Schedule 4, low potential for abuse and dependence, accepted medical applications. Xanax, Darvacet, Valium, Ativan, Ambien, and Tramadol. Basically all of your benzodiazepines, the chill pills as we used to call them. Um, and then Ambien, of course, uh, will help you get to sleep at night. Five, lowest potential for abuse and dependence, used almost exclusively for medical purposes. And this would be your Robitussin cough syrup, Lyrica, and Parapectolin. And again, keeping in mind that, you know, we're looking at medications, for example, Xanax taken in combination with Oxycontin causes people to die. So we're not even looking at combinations, we're just looking at the absurdity. So what do you take away from this? We take away that the system doesn't work because people aren't paying attention. No, it's because people pay a lot of money and donate a lot of money to politicians to vote a certain way. And if you are the lobbyist who works for a pharmaceutical company, you are going to lobby politicians do something a certain way or they're not going to get their donations anymore. So part of the process and a big part of the problem is that the entire system is broke. It's whoever has the most money gets the laws passed. So why is medical cannabis still illegal under federal law? 
The pharmaceutical industry is the most active and powerful opponent of legalized medical cannabis. Its activities take these forms, sponsoring friendly anti-cannabis researchers. So if there's a guy or a girl who works at a university and who is absolutely anti-cannabis, suddenly they're going to be getting grants to study all the negatives on cannabis because that's where they're going to put their money. They're not going to put it in neutral research. They're going to put it in research that they suspect and anticipate, quite frankly, will demonstrate the problems associated with cannabis. Funding friendly anti-cannabis organizations. We're going to talk about one of these in a few minutes, but you'll find um, these uh, billboards and they always have a web address. Go to the web address. You will find that this is an organization that will exist on a website only lobbying government agencies and again pharmaceuticals have money to burn so they can go into your state representative or your senator and say look I know that your problem in your city is really bad and out of control with opioids but we'd really rather you prefer we prefer you not fund anti-opioid research so if you don't, we're not going to give you your donation to get elected again. And it seems sleazy, but the reality is this is exactly how government works. And then mounting public relations campaigns. This whole concept of marijuana being a gateway drug is based on the idea that if you try marijuana, you will feel compelled to try methamphetamine or heroin or ecstasy or peyote. The reality is that most people start with alcohol or cigarettes and yet we do not say anything to them about being gateway drugs. So again there is this hypocrisy and you're going to spin the story and that's why it's important to be informed and to, to legitimize this research because we understand that it's been paid for and bought by a lot of these big companies. All right, I'm going to stop ranting and go and get on with the PowerPoint. In the journal Health Affairs, a study from the University of Georgia was published in 2016 that used data on all prescriptions filled by Medicare Part D enrollees from 2010 to 2013. That's a heck of a lot of people. Um, and that is available through government funding and you can get that kind of stuff if you're doing this uh, level of research. And they found that the use of prescription drugs for which marijuana could serve as a clinical alternative fell significantly once a medical marijuana law was implemented. People would prefer medical marijuana to opioids. That is in many ways the only thing that'll help a person stay off of opioids. On the other hand, a lot of people will say, well, we're still too soon to tell. Still too soon to tell. But the point is that pharmaceutical companies don't want to read this because if they have less people getting their drugs, they're making less money. And we are a capitalist society and we gauge a winner or a loser by how much money they've made, for better or for worse. So the more people who use cannabis products for appropriate conditions, the less people who will get prescriptions for opioids, and this would have a significant financial effect on some of the pharmaceutical companies that have made billions off of opioids. And we're going to talk about that in a lot of detail in a few weeks. So, who else opposes medical cannabis? So, several other industries are connected with drug companies and actively opposing the legalization of cannabis, be it medical or recreational, keeping in mind that they often go in and fund these small organizations together. Beer industry and alcohol distillers, that's a competition. You know, a lot of people would prefer to stay home or, you know, go to a movie use their medical cannabis to help them feel better than to go to a bar and have whiskey. 
Tobacco companies see cannabis as a healthier alternative to tobacco. Although in the last five years, you've seen companies like R.J. Reynolds buying into the cannabis business because they see the writing on the wall. Uh, Marlboro put out a packaging that is what the pre-rolled uh, cannabis cigarettes are going to look like. It was it, it's it's absurd, and yet, you know, the fact that they're kind of giving in really tells you something. And then finally, the prison lobby. Um, years ago, the United States privatized many prisons, which meant that they were. Um, prisons that are run by outside companies. If you've ever watched Orange is the New Black, you'll see how when a private company comes in, it's, you know, there's cost cutting all over the place. And prisons like nonviolent drug offenders. They are easy to manage. They're well behaved. They're usually, in many cases, people who have more of an illness than have a problem in terms of you know, if you're living in an environment where everyone in your family uses methamphetamine, there's a strong possibility that it's just going to get handed to you one day. But that's a discussion for another day. So here's a billboard, and it has a uh, young white girl who is clearly emaciated, who looks sad and depressed. She has stringy blonde hair and dark circles under her eyes and the caption says marijuana what's good about it nothing now if you go to the website www.protectoursociety.org you will find a video of a very um, motherly woman discussing how cannabis is evil and the devil's lettuce you won't find any information about it being a nonprofit, which is required. You won't find any information about who funds it. You won't find any information about how to join or any of that. It's just a website that funnels money into these kinds of billboards that don't say anything. There is literally no facts. So for those of you who may not have taken um, critical thinking yet, you would see that the, the rhetoric here is essentially emotional. It's not about using our brain. It's about, oh, that poor little girl, her mom and dad are smoking pot and she has nothing to eat. No, she would have pizza. We all know it. So a lot of people say, well, what about law enforcement? And to so, a lesser extent, some might say that police and sheriff departments make a lot of rec extra revenue from auctioning off seized property during cannabis bus. And there's a big old cannabis bus there on the right with a very proud looking puppy. However, the vast majority of police officers see it as a waste of their time to arrest cannabis users. Most states have decriminalized small amounts of marijuana so that users get a ticket instead of being arrested. In 2016, a Pew Research poll surveyed 8,000 police officers and they found that 32% of cops thought cannabis should be legal, medical or recreational. 37% of cops thought that medical cannabis should be legal and not recreational. And only 30% of police officers thought cannabis should be totally illegal. So what you're seeing here is essentially 70% of police officers say, look, we've got bigger issues to deal with, legalize it recreationally or medically, but you know this is not as important as some of the other major issues they have to deal with. And what's interesting is police officers tend to be more politically conservative than the average American. So how do average Americans feel? Well, funny you should ask. Among all Americans, Pew Research has found that 49% favor legalizing recreational marijuana and medical cannabis. 35% favor medical cannabis only, and 15% prefer that cannabis stay illegal. 65% of individuals under the age of 35 favor legalizing recreational and medical cannabis 
while 45% of individuals over the age of 35 favor legalizing recreational marijuana and medical cannabis. So as you can see, there is a definite opinion that cannabis is no more harmful than your average beer or glass of wine, and yet federally we're still in this situation where marijuana or medical cannabis is technically still illegal. Now interestingly another very um, interesting statistic that you'll see as we go through is the staggering number of individuals over the age of 50 who are now using medical marijuana and here's a chart that shows you and this is from 2018 even more staggering are the number of people over the age of 60. And I know those numbers don't necessarily um, represent what your expectations are, but you have to remember that culturally, people who are age 35 and older were told their entire lives that cannabis, medical or recreational, was the gateway to being a heroin user and living on the streets. So the fact that we see these numbers, and we're talking 12% of 50-year-olds and almost 8% of people over the age of 60 are admitting to using marijuana. So that's a pretty significant um, increase. So as you see, the people who are older as they go to their great reward will probably these numbers are going to skyrocket and it's going to have to be inevitable at some point as American public opinion changes things because that's how things change by people going to the ballot box and making decisions and making the choices that need to be made in order to allow you to live your life the way you want to live it. So as I've alluded to opposition to cannabis is a cultural issue and again politicians and conservative pundits call it the gateway drug and they you know used all the imagery you can imagine to scare us up to and including cracking an egg in a frying pan and saying this is your brain on drugs which made me hungry but other than that didn't have any other effect Generations of kids who went through the Just Say No program, of which that is my generation, with Nancy Reagan telling us to just say no. And then the D.A.R.E. program have been taught to believe that cannabis has zero redeeming qualities. Throughout the last half of the 20th century, marijuana use was demonized as a way to escape one's responsibilities, as opposed to a beer, which was promoted as a reward for a hard day of work meaning it's Miller time. Instead, now, you know, a lot of people who live in states where it's recreational will go home and say, it's Blue Dream time, or whatever strain is in their state. So again, when we look at these things, we have to look at them from multiple dimensions. So as we start the history piece of it next week, we're also going to be looking at how people perceived it by the culture. And those elements are going to help you better understand how we ended up where we are today. So, I have some work cited for you. Ooh, ah. You'll notice Christopher Ingram is listed twice for two different articles. He's a Washington Post reporter who does write exclusively almost, well not exclusively, but extensively on marijuana decriminalization and uh, medical marijuana. So he's a good resource. That's it for today. I hope everything was interesting and uh, if you have any questions please email or text. Um, on the other side of the coin is if you are not one of my students but you are still interested in asking me a question leave a comment and we'll get back to you. Thanks. Have a great day.